Hello, personnel psychology. All right. Uh, why am I laughing? I'd better laugh. I prefer laughing to crying. Believe it or not, this is the third time I will be recording this lecture today. The first time, I don't know what happened. After eight seconds, it just stopped recording. Although my indicator said it was still right into disk, so I don't know what the hell happened to that one. And then I said, okay, fine, so I will do it again. And uh, at that point in time, I had forgotten to turn on my microphone. Uh, so I can see that the microphone is on. Uh, so that was a lecture and a half that I didn't do. Uh, took a break for office hours. Kind of got my shit back together, I hope. Right? And uh, here, here we go, getting uh, at least this one done. There's three, so we got 3.13, I think it's 3.2, and the 3.21, and 3.22, whatever it is. These will lead to the next homework assignment, so that's why I wanted to do them together. Uh, I'm going to get 3.13 done today and probably save the others for uh, Friday. So the work proceeds, the obstacles continue to occur, and... Uh, the, I, I, I changed gears. I, I did a lecture on emotion before this one, so I think I've got myself back to a, an appropriate emotional state, I hope. <laughs> we better laugh at the tribulations rather than cry, if we can. We need to talk about, in general, psychometric tests, and, and you'll notice we'll get more specific in the next two lectures that will facilitate your completion of the assignment. Uh, the assignment is best understood and explained by the recorded Zoom session for week 10. So if you haven't looked at any of those, the explanation for the assignment is in that recorded Zoom session. You'll probably want to check that out. Okay. So, five basics of psychometric tests, and this is kind of our outline going into it. We're going to define tests, then I want to compare work sample versus psychometric tests. When not to use psychometric tests, which is quite often <laughs> the types of psychometric tests that are available and choosing between tests. But again, this is kind of the general o overview, uh, giving us the flavor of it. The definition of tests, psychometric tests, these are carefully chosen. They should be systematic, standardized procedures for evoking a sample of response from a candidate, right? which are evaluated in a quantifiable, fair, and consistent way. So it's got to yield a number because eventually we're going to combine those numbers to rank order our candidates, so the responses have to be quantifiable. They've got to be evaluated in a fair manner, so we know at the very minimum they should be free of adverse impact, and they should be done in a consistent way, and that ensures the reliability. And we're going to stress the importance of reliability as we move forward. So. They're well-crafted, demonstrating reliability, validity, and fairness. Reliability, well, we'll get, get into that in a minute. And validity uh, is, does it measure what it intends to measure, purports to measure, and is, is it valid in this particular context or this use? Right? And following standardized procedures. And, and for those of us who've done laboratory research, and I know some of you work in research labs, right? when we design experiments, but when we conduct experiments, we attempt to do so in the most consistent fashion, right? So every participant's experience coming into a laboratory should be identical. So that if there's differences in the way they're treated, then how do we know the results are the result of our manipulation and not the result of their different treatment? So it's important that each applicant, in our context, each applicant is treated in an identical manner and tested in an identical setting. Right to eliminate that as potential variables for the observed test results. So, what needs to be identical? The tasks need to be identical. The instructions need to be identical. The setting in which the candidate performs needs to be identical. And the way in which the results of the test are evaluated needs to be identical or as close as possible. Right? Now, tests also should be evaluated based on a large enough sample of similar people. So when we're looking at tests and we're thinking about selecting a test, some of the questions, and we'll get into the more specific questions, but just in general, I want to know, okay, 
How was this test created? How was this test tested? I know it sounds funny, but researchers need to test their tests, right? You know, uh, I've been working on and off on this test, a measure of predatory trait and predatory behavior, right? Well, how did we test the test? to see that it does what it's intended to do and that it's reliable. And we need a relatively large sample size to do that. Now note, when we're using a test, if the test has been properly created, validated, we know the test is reliable, our samples can often be quite small. We might be looking to hire one person and we have 12 candidates. Right? So sample size is about verifying, validating the test, not employing the test necessarily. So now when we look at tests and we say, hey, does this evaluate what, a, so what it's intended to evaluate? Is this a good test? Well, often we're given rules of thumb. We're given these kind of global rules that say, hey, this test needs to be this or this test needs to be that. And so the text and many texts suggest that if you want to measure someone's level of extroversion, you need at least 19 test items to assess their level of uh, extroversion accurately. And I'm gonna, this largely comes from people who work in a personality and trait based kind of context. Uh, not everyone agrees with this, and, and other types of psychologists, myself being a social psychologist, right, establish differences between participants in our research using one, two, or three questions, right? Now, my buddy Derek and I, who did a lot of research together, uh, we typically said, you know, I'm not, I don't want to bet the farm on a single question, a single response item. So we would generally craft three response items that we believe tapped into the same thing. And then we would aggregate the results of those particular three questions. So our general rule of thumb was a three question threshold. Uh, and that allows us to test the, the reliability between those three questions. But this is getting maybe a little too sophisticated for our nature. Right? But we're not usually testing traits. We're not trying to assess someone's traits. We're trying to assess their behavior based on a condition that they were assigned to. Now, a further side on the number of questions, psychologists disagree, and I hope by now, you know, this is a 4,000 level class, I hope by now you understand that psychologists disagree, they disagree frequently, and they disagree with tremendous vigor, right? So, the text also mentions that the ability tests tend to use even more questions, maybe up to 50, and it's like, okay, but... If I'm testing abilities, do I need to be asking questions or do I need to create scenarios where people can demonstrate the ability uh, through observable behavior? So that's, that's another issue. Right? The general trend would be from the, the fewest to the greatest number of questions, but I like observable behavior. Trait type constructs, personality dimensions, yeah, might require some, a multitude of questions. But notice, if I want to look at an ability like typing, keyboard, I have two concerns probably, speed and accuracy. So I'm hiring someone and we've determined in the job analysis that this particular position spends 60% 60 60 of its time keyboarding and we say, wow, 60% of the time that's a person specification and we have to include in our assessment, right? Uh, because in that job, 60% of the time is spent keyboarding. And the two necessary qualities to keyboarding is to be fast and accurate. So notice, this is a very simple test. I ask someone to type, right? I, I give them something to reproduce. Type this, right? And I can measure their speed, and I can measure their accuracy. So a single test might be, you know... Uh, employed. Now, maybe they have to do text and maybe they have to enter things in a spreadsheet, so I might actually have two items within the test of their typing ability. One is typing text and one is typing numerical information into a spreadsheet. And then I combine those scores to get their overall typing skill score. But notice, few items, but this is behavioral test and very directly 
indicates their potential performance on that construct in that person's specification. So now we're into the realm of observable behaviors and abilities rather than traits. And I'm always going to be pushing, hey, can we, can we look at this in terms of behavior rather than in terms of traits? So, and, and stay tuned because that's where your assignment, your next assignment is going to go. What do we know then? Work sample test, behaviors actually performed on the job or at least as closely as possible. Okay. So we try to craft situations in which we can assess a person's, a candidate's performance that it as closely matches what we expect them to do on the job as possible. Okay. These, though, tend to have a narrow range of use. If we give someone a typing test, what are we assessing? Their ability to type. That's it. It doesn't tell us about anything else. It doesn't tell us about how they're going to get along with their coworkers. It doesn't tell us whether they're going to be on time to work. It doesn't tell us anything but their ability to type. Right? But they can be quite accurate in their ability to assess that portion of the person's specification. So all else, all, all else being equal, those are probably the most preferred types of tests that get at abilities via observable behavior. Right. Now, psychometric tests attempt to assess fundamental characteristics of the applicant, and they can generalize a great deal more. That is, you know, well, this per the person's specification dictates that this person will cold call customers, that is, introduce themselves to people they don't know, potential customers, so they'll cold call. They also have to interact with uh, people, different people within our organization, and they have to interact effectively and be proactive in their interactions. And, and so what I'm describing is something that an extrovert might excel at. So notice when we talk extroversion as a trait, it can tend to indicate the type of performance across several different employment contexts. So there's, there's a trade-off there, right? The, when we assess a trade, it's more generalizable to a, a larger number of aspects of performance. I gotta move out of this house. I don't know if you guys could hear that motorcycle. They just race up and down the street. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's bad enough they raced up the street. This is a one-way street, but then they'll race back the other way. Uh, I gotta get out of this. That song, got to get out of this place. Anyone, the band? That's going way in the way back machine, right? This is your grandparents' music. The animals, if you will, 1960s. So, consider that when I first started teaching, I was old as your parent. Now, at this point in my teaching career, I'm much closer to the age of your grandparent. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so, these are certainly more generalizable. They desi are designed to test characteristics that underlie a behavior, not the behavior. So that's kind of the trade-off. And, and that requires a leap of inference, that this type of trait should excel at this type of behavior. And notice, th then, if you have to defend your use of this test in court, this is more problematic. It's easy to say, hey, we gave them a typing test because we're hiring typists, and people would say, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty defensible, isn't it? But if I say, I gave them this test on extroversion because they have to interact with others, now we have this kind of interim in inferential step that I have to support. It's not measuring the actual behavior. So when shouldn't we use psychometric tests? Well, Assessing impact on others, interpersonal skills, we can observe this. We can give people a group exercise. We can do a role, plot, a role play. Think about it. If we're hiring customer service reps, what should we do? We should have one of our employees come in and be a disgruntled customer and have them interact in a role play with the applicant and see how the applicant reacts to a hostile customer. I mean, and we can develop a rubric. We can grade things like, hey, was their body, how did their body language, did it mean consistent? Did they get closed up? Did they become combative? Did their tone of voice change? Just lots of constructs that we can look at here. Oral communication. Hey, let's measure directly. We did this at Columbus State. I've told you before. Come on in and give a lecture on the functions of a neuron. No more than 10 minutes. Right? We can actually watch them do it. We could be students sitting in a classroom, and this is the lecture the students will receive. Right? And we develop a way to, a rubric to assess that and score it. Right? So role play, meetings, group interviews. But you know the downside to group interviews? 
Psychopaths excel. All right. When not to use psychometric tests, hey, physical ability. Let's test the ability, <laughs> right? Operating equipment. I'm hiring forklift drivers. Why not? I want an experienced forklift driver. Why not take them out into the parking lot and have them move some pallets around with a forklift? Okay. Strategic thinking, planning, written work, work history. We might look at what they've done in the past. Hey, give us an outline of a project that you handled. Bring that with you, right? This one is problematic because this might be a relatively complex phenomenon that took multiple steps, so it might not be as easily tested in an assessment center, so we might want to work product. If we're hiring an academic researcher, bring us your publications. Submit three of your publications, right? And, and that would be verifiable work product then. Note that some work product can be difficult though because we might not have a guarantee that it's the person's own work product. Now, in the academic, you know, peer-reviewed journal articles, obviously we know it's theirs. Experience, qualifications, and education. We don't need tests. What we need is the records, right? So, Let's suppose we want to use a psychometric test. How on earth do we choose this test? Well, the sensory motor, sensory acuity, think about it. Where might you guys go? We've already been there in class. You've already had an assignment on this. You remember the PAQ? Yeah, the PAQ. What a great example, right? Makes fine motor movements like a surgeon, okay? Or makes gross motor movements, gross hand movements by stacking boxes, right? Wow, we've already got a great source for these. So, why not use those? Mental ability, attainment, measures what's been learned, assess present performance. But notice that many measures of attainment top out. Okay. When I was taking the GRE, and that's a long time ago now, uh, I took the GRE the math score, the math component of the GRE, a lot of people scored a perfect score. So those people aren't being differentiated. If 5% of the people who take the GRE, and the way it was scored was 800 for the math portion when I was doing it, right? If, if they score an 800 or the SAT, you know, if 10% of the people score an 800, then the math is not differentiating those top 10%. They all fall into one lump as perfect, if you will, right? So we have to be careful that we don't have what's called a restriction of range. That is where we get a bunch of people all at the top of the scale. Now, aptitude or ability, right, is different than attainment. Attainment measures what I'm able to do, what I've done, right? Aptitude measures potential. And, and so trainability is one potential aspect, and we've talked about should I hire or should I train? What is my philosophy there? Well, if I want to train, I should then probably be at least assessing to what extent is this person trainable. And you can imagine that's maybe not hard to design a test where people are exposed to new information and see how quickly they learn it or are they in fact trainable. You can create a bogus, bogus task that no one would know and see who can pick it up and, and to, and, and to what level they pick it up. We can quantify that. Right. Now, ability is thought to be more general, global than aptitude. So abilities like mental ability is one thing, but saying, hey, you have an aptitude for linguistics is more specific. Again, though, these are probably not the most useful measures. General intelligence is probably one of the least useful measures. Right? So work samples that involve reasoning and or judgment probably better than an IQ score, if you will. Situational questions that tap into re reasoning and analysis are probably best, right? And also are probably the most fair to applicants, that is, most equal to the applicants. So we can bring people in, give them a situational test, and then score their performance on that. Inadequate methods, inequitable measures is all of the methods of general intelligence. And why are we measuring general intelligence anyway? It's probably not all that predictive of the person specifications we have isolated. So why bother? So And notice that intelligence also has potential to create a tremendous amount of adverse impact.
questions. So, Choosing a psychometric test, well, we can look at numerical ability. There's tests for that. Verbal abilities, tests for that. Spatial ability, mechanical reasoning, specific occupational skills. These tests all are available out there. And uh, that's usually where we start with tests is we look at what's available out there go ahead and try that see how it's been used and if it works well for us good if it doesn't then we may modify from there and this is a lot about what your homework assignment is about so we're getting there three lectures leading up to it now choosing a psychometric test for personality or traits what do we know about traits they're defined as enduring characteristics of the person so traits are largely in place sometime in middle childhood they really get kind of solidified in adolescence and then we carry them with us basically throughout life now there's exceptions to that right but traits are usually relatively stable the expected behavioral style across a wide range of situations or context is so the idea is if I'm an honest person then I'm likely to be honest across a wide variety of situations likewise if I'm a dishonest person that should manifest itself across multiple contexts this is the beauty of traits is they predict what someone will do across these different contexts at least hopefully that is the promise these usually employ relatively opaque questions and we're going to get to the definition of here in just a minute now temporary conditions though and you maybe heard the term state versus trait right especially when it applies to self-esteem within the psychological context global self-esteem is trait self-esteem one's general level of self-esteem across a wide variety of context state self-esteem is how you feeling about yourself right now right and and the beauty of state self-esteem once people theorized that it existed was wow we can study the effects of self-esteem in the laboratory state self-esteem because we can manipulate it we can give people feedback that says hey you did really well or we can give people that feedback that said oh my god you did so horribly that affects their self-esteem in a temporary basis and we could study the effects in the laboratory this is not necessarily useful in the candidate candidate selection All right so trait measures may be not the best way to go now trait tests are often contaminated by participants current state so in our research in our lab what we always did was ask people how are you doing is everything okay how are you feeling today uh, you know you ready to go etc I would do this with my applicants in an assessment center how is everything how's the past week been you feeling good about life suffered any serious blows or setbacks anything that might affect your performance today because I want to give people an honest shot at turning in their best performance and if someone has suffered a significant personal loss or significant personal setback in the last couple of days, it might in fact affect their performance on the assessment that we're about to give them now. So to the extent that we're empathetic, we say, oh my God, you know, and to the extent that our timetable allows it, we say, you know, it sounds like you've had a hell of a week. That's a week I wouldn't wish on anyone. Would you rather reschedule to do this next week when things maybe have calmed down a little bit? if your time schedule allows right but as part of being a human being right an empathetic human being and caring about each other now we've also found that existing traits can sensitize participants to features of the environment and that is a state cause this was beneficial in our research we found that people who are high in authoritarianism were more sensitive to transgressions and got more angry about it so authoritarians were very sensitive to what aspects of their environment that they believe were out of control and they needed to respond more rigorously to that so we can see the traits sensitize people to features of the environment that's not necessarily a bad thing to discover within our assessment uh, so let's talk a little bit about the personality tests they're rarely used in selection with good reason right uh, first of all some of us might consider it invasive others maybe not so much but they're generally not all that predictive we can find better ways to predict on the job behavior than through personality tests they're often used in counseling situations to a greater extent 
or advisory situations. And they can be classified as broad or narrow. Broad spectrum tests like the MMPI, which we'll discuss in the next lecture, I believe it is, test 13 different qualities. Or what about the big five personality tests, the NEO? OCEAN is another acronym for it, right? That tests five personality constructs, not one. But maybe I'm hiring salespeople and I'm interested in their level of self-monitoring. And self-monitoring is the ability to see the impact I'm having on someone and then desire to change the way I'm coming off to them to change the way they're responding. So I might be a salesperson and I'm interacting with this person and, and I can see their body language is kind of closed and they're not really warming up to me. So I'm going to change my approach. I'm going to present myself in a different way to open them up, right, to make them more receptive to my pitch. I'm describing someone who's a high self-monitor. But notice, this is a very narrowly defined construct, but it might be very useful to test people on their self-monitoring when we're talking about hiring people for sales positions, where they have to interact with a wide variety of diverse audience. Right? So that's a narrow spectrum test rather than a broad spectrum test like the NEO that tests extroversion, openness, conscientiousness, this, this broad spectrum of components. But defensibility can be an issue in these. They're harder to defend. I'm not saying they can't be defended. I'm just saying it's more difficult. Go back to the typing example. Easy to defend. We're looking for someone to input data. We want accuracy and we want speed. That's what we tested, and that's how we rank order of candidates, right? If we test conscientiousness, well, we want people who want to do a good job, and we believe conscientious people do a good job, so we tested the typing applicants on conscientiousness. And it's like, but couldn't conscientiousness be interpreted? And then we're off and running in, in all these different paths. And so the more specific the test to the person's specification, the easier it is going to be defend. Right? And, and we might run into issues with diversity when we start testing personality constructs, a strange form of diversity. Not gender diversity, not ethnic diversity, not religious diversity. But you know, we decide, hey, we're going to hire extroverts, right? Well, then what happens to the introverts? Then we don't have trait diversity. And I know no one ever really kind of talks about that, but I find it an interesting concept to consider. Okay. Now, one thing for sure that many people want to measure is motivation. I want someone to work hard for me. Will this person work hard for me? How can I know? Well, this is a difficult quality to measure. <laughs> and Typically, the thematic apperception test was used. It's very difficult to score, requires a lot of training. The scoring is very subjective and can be rather unreliable when we have multiple people scoring the, the same observations. Also, motivational tests are pretty easily faked. That is, I understand what you're trying to get at. You're trying to get at my level of motivation. Obviously, I want to present myself as highly motivated. So whether I am or not, I'm going to pretend that I am. So often, these, these are difficult, right? Behavioral observational measures might be better. And then it takes some imagination. And I'm going to push at you in the homework assignment to use your imagination at one point. But let's look at McClellan's need theory. Uh, in Psychomotivation, one of the books we use is Dr. Reese's 16 Basic Human Desires. And Reese, through his research, has determined that w there are 16 human desires, th 16 basic human desires, and that we vary on these desires. So I might be high on two or three desires, low on five or six, and kind of middling on the rest of the desires. So we each have our unique desire profile and in the class we use the book and everyone then is able to assess their own desire profile and, and, and write a paper on that. Is desires, my desires motivate my choices, right? Well, the idea here with McClellan's need theory, and it was occupationally inspired, right? That's where McClellan was working. He says there's not 16 basic desires. Reese came well after McClellan, so he didn't say that. But McClellan said there's three basic needs, and these needs then cause people to be motivated to fulfill those needs. So that's the relationship of need to motivation. Right? He said some people have a high need for achievement. Others do not. Right? That is desire to accomplish something difficult. Some people have a strong need for affiliation, or they don't. 
right? And this is the desire to spend time in social relationships and activities. Further than the third, need for power. Some people have a strong desire to influence, coach, teach, or encourage others to achieve. Well, let's think about this. Let's think about some occupations now. I'm a teacher. Should I have a high need for power? Well, according to McClellan, I better, because that's my desire to influence, coach, teach, encourage others to achieve. Okay? But notice how a need for power could also then cause me to be less than a desirable teacher. That is, I might like to flex my muscle on students, put them in their place, make them feel bad, control, be overly controlling, right? Uh, all, all those things. So it's a double-edged sword. And, and this is where I, I'm, I'm getting at the idea that maybe these trait type measures aren't the best way to go, right? But a teacher probably should have a relatively low need for affiliation. That is, I shouldn't be about trying to make students my friends necessarily because that could interfere with the accurate assessment of student work product, right? And, and need for achievement, should a teacher have a high need for achievement? Well, you might argue no, because really what I'm about as a teacher should be helping you to achieve, right? And especially if I'm a research advisor, if you're graduate students and I'm your advisor, my need for achievement better be in check because we don't want me taking your work and your ideas and using them for myself and saying, look what I did, when it's actually what you did. For a manager, well, McClellan said they should have a low need for achievement. Managers should have low need for achievement because it's their workers that need to achieve, right? They should have a low need for affiliation, and we know what it's like to have a boss who wants to be everybody's friend. It usually turns out horribly, but they do need a high need for power, a lot like a teacher, right? So how do we get at these? How do we determine what your need profile is? Well, this is where it gets a little strange. I show you pictures like this. And this is the thematic apperception test. These are standardized pictures, right, that belong in the TAT. And, and what I do is I show you this and I say, okay, let's talk about this for a minute. What do you think is going on here? Who do you think these people are? What do you think is their relationship? What do you think happened before this picture was taken or drawn? What do you think is going to happen next? Long term, how do you, how do you, what, what do you see for these two? Now notice, there's no information here at all. This is a Rorschach inkblot test using human figures rather than ink blots. There is no correct answer. Basically what I'm listening to, and, and uh, I'm not an expert at scoring this by any means, but what I'm listening to is what do you tend to talk about when you look at this ambiguous picture because you can talk about anything and that's coming from you. Do you tend to gravitate towards conversation about their power differential, their power relationship? Do you tend to concentrate your conversation on the nature of their relationship, their affiliation. Or, right, uh, the, the, like I said, the power differential or, or the affiliation between, between these. So then I use that to create a need profile for you. Well, notice that this is going to be problematic if I tried to defend the use of this test. Right? I can be a lot, asked a lot of questions that are going to stump me or are going to be allow, open to interpretation. This is a very subjective. So this, this is probably not the way to go necessarily. Now, the transparent as promised versus the opaque, right? Or if you prefer conscious versus non-conscious measures. This is a non-conscious measure. What we're doing is, is we're pulling the contents out of the unconscious. If you want to be Freudian about it, if you want to be social psychological about it, I'm going to say the non-conscious. But we're pulling this information out because there's no information present here. So you're not discerning information here. What we're doing is getting information from you that's non-consciously. It's not necessarily available until you're asked about it. Explicit tends it tests tend to be obvious as to what's being tested, so you watch for shaking, faking. If I ask you the question, have you ever stolen anything from a previous employer, that's a relatively <laughs> obvious question, is it not? I mean, that's transparent. What is this guy asking me? He's asking me if I ever stole. Why is he asking me this? Because he wants to know if I'm going to steal from him. How should I answer? No, I've never stolen, right? It's transparent. It's easily faked. Now, implicit tests like this, though, it's like, what the hell? 
are they asking me? I have no clue, so I'm going to talk, and hopefully I'm going to reveal something about myself. At least that's what the person using the test. Ah, you're going to review your true inner nature by answering questions about this test. Yeah. So it's opaque. That is, I can't see what the point is. And it's testing implicit qualities, non-conscious qualities. Implicit tests hide their purpose, less able to fake, but... Trying to defend these within a legal context can be problematic. And also, notice, if you're a participant in my, if you're an applicant in my assessment center, and I ask you a bunch of questions about this, you walk away going, what the hell was that for? So note that the applicant is going to walk away saying, I got no clue what they were doing there. So you might want to, or find it necessary to debrief the participant, the applicant, after they've been subjected to these kind of opaque tests. Right? Now, we also have to consider, do I want to assess typical performance or optimal performance? And that might vary on the nature of the job. You might want to measure both, so just be prepared in your head to differentiate the two. Typical performance measures how it's usually done. Personality, motivation, interest, beliefs might better tap into this, Optimal performance might measure one's best effort, strength, endurance, speed of reasoning, power of reasoning, or perhaps, strangely enough, the volume of creativity. Can creativity be measured? You betcha. And there's a lot of different measures of creativity. Uh, and if you want to learn more about creativity within a psychological context, what are you going to do about it? I would recommend taken Dr. Stephen Bingle's course in psychology creativity, right? I mean, I was teaching psychology creativity around 2004, 2005. Uh, I took over the course from a retired professor who was not, honestly, not doing a real good job about it, and that, that's why they asked me if I would take over the class. And then it's been handed off and handed off, but now it's landed in Bengal's lap. And I'm telling you, I sat in on Bengal's class, and it's freaking awesome. God, he's good. He's young, and he's got a teaching career ahead of him that is just going to be stupendous. So if you have an opportunity to take one of Bingle's classes, do it, but especially the psychology of creativity. Yes, creativity can be tested. So anyway, choosing between us, the initial trawl, so we're in our trawler, we cast our net, we're going to see what we bring up out of the sea, right? Well, and this gets to your assignment. The example I used in your assignment is patience. How do we know if an applicant is patient? How do we test patience? And I'm like, I don't know. Wow, is there some way to measure patience? So what did I do? And as described in the instructions and, and also in, uh, as I suggested in our Zoom session for week 10, I went to Google and, and asked, how do I test patience? And now, of course, I get, this is my initial troll. I get all kinds of information. And, you know, there's a patience test in psychology today, right? And I'm like, okay, that's cute, but th that ain't going to cut it, right? I, I need something more empirically supported. But I go through and I start looking at the information. 90% of what you want exists on the Internet. But there's about 150% of shit you don't need on the Internet. So one of the challenges for us is to become good consumers of information, separate the good from the bad necessarily. Anyway, so I go, I look at manuals, testing manuals, I go to websites, I Google, I talk to people I know, what have you done in the past, does anyone know I might belong to professional organizations and I put it out there, does anyone know of a reliable test of uh, perseverance, right? And I, and I put it out there. And now I got this long list. What I want to assess, and I probably put them in a spreadsheet, and I said, can return to the matrix to compare, right? Uh, return to the matrix. Does this measure the relevant characteristic? And I can rate it. To what degree do I believe it does? At the appropriate level, right? Do, will, will this differentiate my candidates? Because it's no good to me if it doesn't differentiate candidates. If everyone scores 100%, then I might as well not use the test, right? Ultimate considerations is how long does this take and how does it fit into my assessment program, right? Do I have time to do this? Do I need to find something that takes less time? And what is the cost? Can I use this for free? Is it copyrighted? Do I have to pay? Do I have to have someone come in and administer it, 
right? In the state of Ohio, if I want to use the NEO, we use the NEO, that is the Big Five test, in a creative creativity class one semester when I was teaching creativity. But in the state of Ohio, I can't use the NEO. You have to be a licensed clinician to use the NEO. I'm not a licensed clinician. I'm a freaky social psychologist, right? So I had to have a licensed clinician come in to administer the NEO to the students in the class, right? We were doing some research on personality characteristics and creativity, so uh, which came to naught, and a lot of research does. So, choosing between the tests, then I got this long ass list, right? Now I'm gonna start checking more boxes. Like, is this test freely available, and does that matter? Am I willing to pay, or do I want something that I can use for free? How long is it? Is it too long? Time again. Excessive claims of reliability and validity. This is somebody else's test, and they want to sell me this test, right? And they say, oh, my God, this is the most predictive test on the planet. And I'm going to look at their statistics and say, is this a sales pitch or is this reality? Is, is it, you know, a sales pitch that incorporates reality? But, of course, they're going to tell me it's the best test ever. What is their evidence that they back that claim up? with, right? Does it sound too good to be true? And we know if it sounds too good to be true. Okay. In looking at the statistical analysis of the test, has it been given to different samples? Has it been given to samples that are similar to my candidates? And what does a standard deviation look like? And we're going to get into this more in the next lecture. But I want tests that demonstrate a small standard deviation. If it's a large standard deviation, if there's a lot of variance in the scores, right, then there might be a problem with the test, and I might want to shy away from it. Yes, our statistics classes did actually tend to teach us something useful. But we might have to learn to apply that knowledge that the knowledge was given to us in a more general fashion. Does this test demonstrate a history of bias? Have people demonstrated adverse impact as a result of using this test? And if, if so, then we have to take a good hard look at it and say, could this then affect my applicants, right? And are, are, are my applicants demographically in a disadvantaged set with this test, then I probably want to reject that test. Do norms exist for the test? So for an IQ test, I mean, the norms, it's replete with norms, right? I mean, there's, there's a, it's a norm test. It's got a low standard deviation. It's uh, very accurate in assessing the constructs that it assesses, but it isn't necessarily applicable to what I need to know, so we get to that. But these are all questions that we learn to ask about the tests. So there's more on validity coming up. Let me do an official woohoo. All right, more on validity, more on reliability coming up in, in the next lecture. And, and we're going to start pushing this conversation from the conceptual to the detailed to facilitate your awesome performance on the next homework assignment. So, you guys, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.